starting a new uh, uh, feature in this class. It's called Skills and Context, which just happens to spell sick because it's so sick, it's awesome. <laughs> right? Skills and Context. And what I want to do is I've reserved this room uh, from 3 to 5 on Tuesdays for the remainder of the semester. Um, we may not do every week, but we'll do a lot of weeks. And we'll have sessions where we do things like do practice questions, practice multiple choice, learn how better how to uh, diagram a, uh, a statute, how to structure an essay, how to do an essay, do some practice exams and things like that. We do lots and lots of practice and lots and lots of feedback. And so I'm um, still working out the details of it, but um, you may not realize that this is the inauguration of the skills and context uh, sessions. So I'm going to say uh, to uh, uh, Juan, who's reviewing this video now, um, after I put down my hand, please go ahead and cut the video. And then I'm going to post this to my YouTube site. Um, you guys are, of course, um, I think, probably familiar with my YouTube site. And this will be posted so you can go back and look at it. So, action. Good afternoon, guys. Um, thank you for coming. I didn't give you a chance to say good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. Nice. All right, thank you for coming to this voluntary session. I'm heartened to see such wonderful turnout. Today we're inaugurating a new program for our first year class, for my first year SIPRO class, which is still Skills in Context, at SIC. And we're going to be meeting on a regular basis to work on things like essay exam, skills, multiple choice skills, um, how to read a statute, skills, and things like that. The reason I call it skills in context is I believe that lawyering skills can be taught without some sort of substantive legal context um, to place them in. In other words, the best way to learn how to do an essay is to do it in the context of one of your classes where you're actually getting feedback based on what the professor's teaching you. So that's what we're going to do today. Our first SIC section, session is going to be about personal jurisdiction. And we're going to go through this um, basic stream of commerce essay. We're going to pull out some of the pertinent facts and try to issue spot. And then we're going to go through the coggle and figure out which parts of the coggle, in other words, which parts of personal jurisdiction would be reasonably raised by the fact pattern and thus worthy of discussion. Um, by way of going through the coggle, we'll also do a review. A brief review, but a, a, a fairly thorough review um, of personal jurisdiction. Thus, I also call it a PJ Big Picture Day. The idea of tying it all together so you can see how it all works in the context of this essay. So without further ado, uh, each and every one of you should have a copy of this essay right here. Is anybody missing one? Here you go. Here's the essay. There you go. Welcome. Now, this essay was written by another one of my past ALIs, uh, Christina Morales, in 2012 and 2013. Again, Christina, like Brittany, was a one elk in my class, and then later on served as my assistant to help uh, teaching skills uh, to my students. And uh, she wrote this essay, the Amazon uh, Fact Pattern. And I liked it so much that not only did she use it for a, a skills session, but additionally, um, I asked her, could I use this on, on the website? So if you're watching at home, you can pull up this by going to the assignments page or by going to nathanson.org, then clicking on Civ Pro or in Civ Pro resources, then click on essay uh, resources, and you'll find both a simplified and more advanced Amazon uh, fact pattern. And what we're going to do today is the more simplified fact pattern. It's essentially a stream of commerce fact pattern. There's a few more issues in there. And we're going to start off with the fact pattern. What I recommend you do is, I have the fact pattern on the left, and on the right, I've given you space to write. And you should write down the issues that we spot, and start thinking about how you might organize those in an actual essay exam. All right. What's the first thing you do with an essay question? Do you read the fact pattern? Is that the first thing? Call the question. Very good. Call the question. <laughs> Assuming the California's long arm statute extends the full scope of due process, discuss whether the court has personal jurisdiction over FedExpress. 
So we know that the issue is PJ, right? And PJ regarding Fed Express is being the defendant. Yet when we go up to the fact pattern, we see there's Amazon and Fed Express, right? So Amazon is not the issue, is it? Fed Express is the issue. And we're going to see it's Peter Parker versus two defendants, Amazon and Fed Express, all right? The next thing you might want to do is figure out what court you're in, right? Because that's going to determine whether you use Rule 4K or whether you use just state law. Well, Peter files in California State Court, right? Amazon doesn't object to PJ, but Fed Express makes a special appearance and timely contests personal jurisdiction. So we know some important stuff already, right? It's Peter Parker, PP, versus Amazon and Fed Express. And Fed Express is the one that's objecting to PJ, and Amazon is not. Now that we have this information, we can go and read the fact pattern in full and start spotting pertinent facts that are going to raise issues. All right, let's do that. Amazon is a corporation from California with its principal operations in California. All right, so we know Amazon is PPOB in California, and it's Inc. Incorporated in California, and it's been sued in California. Is there going to be PJ over Amazon? Yes. Any kind, right? It doesn't matter where the injury happened or where the claim arose. In fact, it arose in France, right? As we'll see in a moment. We don't care that the injury and the accident was in France because Amazon is at home in California and is subject to general in personam jurisdiction. And that's why Amazon does not object to personal jurisdiction. All right. So now we go back to more of a fact pattern. Fed Express is a delivery company incorporated in Delaware with headquarters in Atlanta. So now we know Fed Express is incorporated in, oh, what did it say? Del Delaware. Delaware. And its PPOB is in Georgia. All right. Now, what place or places would Fed Express be subject to general jurisdiction? Delaware, Georgia. Delaware, Georgia, right? Because we know from Goodyear and Daimler that a corporation is always going to be subject to general jurisdiction in its state or state, state or states or places of incorporation and its principal place of business, right? That's where it's always going to be at home. Now, of course, the suit's in California, not Delaware, uh, not Georgia. So now we have to start thinking about what ties or relations does Amazon, excuse me, does uh, Fed Express uh, have with the state um, of California? That would be for minimum contacts. And we should also be spotting whether there's any sort of traditional basis, right? So minimum contacts, specific and general jurisdiction. And then you have any traditional basis. That would be waiver, right? Consent, uh, uh, property in the state, right? You can't have tag jurisdiction against a corporation at all. So we already know that there's going to be no tag jurisdiction because the defendant is a corporation. Well, let's look into the facts more. Fed Express, a delivery company incorporated in Delaware with headquarters in Atlanta, reads about this on Wall Street WSJ.com website. They read that Amazon from California wants to expand its mail order offerings. All right? So since Fed Express learns that Amazon from California wants to expand its offerings, Fed Express contacts Amazon to offer a long-term contract. A long-term contract, what case should you start thinking about immediately? Long-term contract. What's that? Burger King. Burger King, right? Burger King talked about extended negotiations, the length of the contract, things like that. Things that might suggest purposeful availment through a contract. We learn more about Fed Express. Fred Express is a well-established delivery company that has done deliveries throughout the United States and other countries for 20 years. All right. Throughout the United States, might that include California? Yes. <laughs> Does, Cal does other countries include California? Don't overthink it. Yeah, literally speaking, no. Literally speaking, no, right? What contacts do we care about? 
We're in state court in California. What contacts are going to matter? Contacts with France? With a foreign state, which is? California. All right. Well, this next paragraph starts helping us out, doesn't it? Fed Express is well established. It's done deliveries throughout the whole country for over 20 years. Whoa, this looks important. In California alone, let me get a highlighter here. California alone, it does daily deliveries throughout the state, totaling over a billion dollars a year in revenue. Now think about it. It's already doing over a billion dollars a year in California, and that's before the contract with Amazon, right? Does that sound pretty significant? Yeah. Okay. How significant? Is it continuous? Yes. Systematic? Yes. Should we start thinking about general jurisdiction? Yes. yes, we should. Is California the state of the PPOB? No. No. This is the state of the incorporation. No. Is there another way to have general jurisdiction under Daimler? Fall back general jurisdiction in exceptional circumstances per to footnote 19 of Daimler, right? So here, let's get that pen back, back the pen, and here we should start thinking general jurisdiction, question mark, footnote 19, continuous and systematic seems to be satisfied, right? Is Amazon so continuously and systematically at in the state of California that it's essentially at home. That's going to be the hard question, right? So now we already know that you've got to talk about general jurisdiction, don't we? You think you're also going to have to talk about specific? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get to that. We already know that even before the contract, that there's systematic and continuous contacts between Fed Express, from Georgia and Delaware, Contacts in the state of California over a billion bucks a year before the contract. On the other hand, it's a lot of money, but it's only 5% of Fed Express's total revenues, right? So it's large money wise, it's relatively paltry percentage wise, right? Food for thought. Let's get into the contract. Hoping for the contract, the CEO travels out to California on three occasions. Does that sound like a contact? Is that, is that like worldwide where the plaintiff took the defendant's goods out to the forum state? Or is this more say like, oh, I don't know, McGee or International Shoe or Hanson where the defendant purposefully availed itself of the forum state? Defendant CEO, chief executive officer, travels out to California to negotiate, right? Who's, who's going out to California? CEO of who? Plaintiff or defendant? The defendant, right? Is that purposeful availment? Yes. Seems like we have lots of purposeful availment here, don't we? A billion dollars worth of shipments in the state, and now the CEO is traveling out to the state to negotiate, right? Fair enough. After a month of negotiations, we're still thinking BK, aren't we? BK. As a contract. Fed Express will provide worldwide delivery services for Amazon for five years. Again, does this remind us of Burger King? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Not as long term as Burger King, but five years is still a pretty significant contract. And it's worldwide delivery services for Amazon. Guaranteed monthly minimum payment. Overages under a formula, looking at the place of delivery and the weight. Under the contract, all materials will be picked up by Fed Express in California and then shipped. Now, Fed Express is going to have to pick up the goods, right? What's Fed Express going to be sending to the Amazon uh, plant, Amazon warehouses? How's Fed Express going to get that stuff from Amazon? Trucks, right? Right. I mean, we're probably not in drone error, right? Error, right? So it's going to be trucks. It's going to be Fed Express trucks now going to the warehouses in California to get that stuff to ship it wherever. Sounds like more purposeful availability, doesn't it? All right. In addition, some of the Fed Express trucks will be devoted solely to delivery of Amazon products. We'll bear the logos of both Fed Express and Amazon. All right. Here's our contacts, right? So not only do we have a billion dollars 
worth of uh, pre-existing business every year in California. Sounds pretty systematic and continuous. And to be clear, we're talking about purposeful availment here, right? Mm -hmm. Fed Express wasn't dragged to California by somebody driving an Audi. Fed Express went there, entering into business deals to deliver. Oh, yeah, I'll go to your place and pick up your stuff. Yeah, I'll go deliver stuff to you. They chose to do that. They did. Fed Express has purposefully availed itself of the benefits and protections of the laws of California through its continuous and systematic operations of deliveries and pickups in California and has expanded those contacts, expanded its purposeful availment by purposefully soliciting and negotiating and signing a five-year contract. We don't know how much it's worth, but we have to assume that it's worth additional billions, billions of dollars. This is a big business deal. Big deal. So now we have our base of contact facts. It looks like we have purposeful availment. It looks like it's going to be enough. Well, excuse me. It, it, it's enough to certainly raise the question of general jurisdiction. Whether it's enough for general jurisdiction, we'll talk about later, right? But what about specific? Right? Specific requires the context to give rise to the claim, doesn't it? Well, let's look at the next fact. One of Fed Express's dual branded Fed Express Amazon trucks later gets into an accident in Paris, France with Peter Parker. Okay? It, an accident in Paris with Peter Parker. Now, Peter's from New York. Peter chooses to sue both Amazon and Fed Express in California State Court. For negligence, right? Amazon doesn't object to PJ. So, dumb question. Because Amazon doesn't object to PJ, is there PJ? Yes, yes it's waived it, right? <clears throat> if Amazon objected to PJ, would that objection prevail? Or instead, would there be PJ over Amazon despite any objection? Yes. Yeah, there'd still be general jurisdiction. So, Amazon doesn't object at all. It wisely chooses not to object. Fed Express, however, does object. And it's a very debatable issue, right? There's lots and lots of contacts, but are those contacts enough to render Amazon, render Fed Express at home? I don't know. Looks like you'll have to analyze that. Analysis, counter analysis. Regarding specific jurisdiction, again, we have more than a single contact. We have systematic and continuous contacts, right? There's no doubt about that. The harder issue is going to be. Did those contacts give rise to the claim under the evidence test or the but for test? So you're already starting to think about the structure of your essay, right? But you have to talk about the long arm. They talk about due process. And under due process, you've got to talk about general and specific, right? And, and, and there you go. You have lots of stuff to talk about. It's, it's, it's not the biggest PJ essay, but it's got lots of media issues for you to discuss. There's one last thing to add to the mix, and then we're going to jump into the Coggle and see how you can use the Coggle both as a way to study and review a personal jurisdiction, the second as a way for me to give you a mini review on personal jurisdiction, and third, something for you to kind of internalize as a way of going through your checklist in your head when you have a fact pattern, figure out what issues are reasonably raised by that fact on pattern. Alright, so our last thing here is, goes back to the call of question, right? Remember, we're in California State Court. And it says, assuming that California's long-arm statute extends the full scope of due process, blah, 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 discuss whether there's PJ over on Amazon. Well, I then just gave you information about California's long-arm statute, right? And we talked about enumerated versus unenumerated long-arm statutes. We'll talk about that more in a couple minutes. But to analyze PJ in state court, or to analyze PJ in federal court under Rule 4K, uh, 4K1A, 4K1, oh, now I'm getting confused, under 4K1A, that you have to analyze both the long arm and 14th Amendment due process, right? So you absolutely need to know about the long arm statute. So if I give you PJ questions in multiple choice, I'll let you know either in the question or in the general instructions, what kind of long arm governs. Equally so, in an essay question where you have to analyze PJ, I will always tell you about the long arm statute. 
I'll either tell you about it, like I say there, or I will give you the text of the long arm statute. But I would never just not give you the long arm. You need to have the long arm. That will be supplied uh, by me. All right, let's move into the Coggle itself. All right. Now, with the Coggle, and here I have the PDF of it, it's not intended to be printed out. It's intended to be navigated like a road, right? Think of like a map, right? You could have a map of Miami, but if you had a map of Miami that was life-size, it would be of no use to you, right? So you zoom in, you zoom out, you look at the part that's pertinent to you. Well, where you have to start is right here. Are you in federal court or are you in state court? Federal court or state court? We're in state court. Now, I'm going to pretend for the moment that we're in federal court, okay? If we're in state court or federal court, then we, we ignore the left-hand part of the coggle, and then none of this stuff applies at all, okay? So if you're in state court, left side doesn't matter at all. Rule 4K doesn't matter at all. Why? Because Rule 4K isn't part of the federal rules of civil procedure. It applies in federal court, right? On the other hand, if we're in federal court, then you have to start thinking about Rule 4K. And being in federal court means that we're in federal court, either because the case was filed in federal court or because it was, it was removed from state court to federal court, right? So always read the facts carefully. Know what court you're in, because that's really important. Let's pretend for a moment we're in federal court. I'm going to start with Rule 4K. 4K1A is the when in Rome, do the Romans do rule, right? When in federal court, we analyze PJ as if we were in the corresponding state court. So if we were in federal court in California, we would look to how PJ would be analyzed in federal court in California, in state court in California. And that means look at 14th Amendment due process and the California long arm statute. And if all you're analyzing was 4K1A, then you would then jump over to the right hand side of the cobble and proceed from there. But again, let's imagine we're in federal court for a moment. Okay? Keep in mind that federal courts can have broader PJ because the scope of the Fifth Amendment allows PJ broader than what would be allowed or okay under the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment limits what states can do. States have smaller borders than the United States, which is much bigger. And since the Fifth Amendment deals with a larger sovereign with bigger territory, the scope of PJ in federal court can be much bigger. Now, Rule 4K doesn't grant PJ necessarily always to the full scope of the Fifth Amendment. Instead, we have to look to Rule 4K. Now, Rule 4K1A isn't about the Fifth Amendment. That's about treating federal court the same as state court laws would work, right? State law law plus 14th Amendment due process go to the right-hand side of the coggle. But there's other bases in Rule 4K. It's 4K1B, 4K1C, and 4K2 that can apply in federal court and cannot apply in state court. If I give you a fact pattern and you're in state court, don't start talking to me about bulge jurisdiction or the federal law law under 4K2 because they don't apply. That would be negative issue spotting. Don't go there. Well, there are some additional bases in federal court for PJ that aren't available at all in state court. The first one is the bulge rule, right? That's when a defendant is joined under Rule 14 or 19. Think of Asahi, right? P sues D, and then D brings in a third party defendant. So Zerker sues Shen Shen, and then Shen Shen sues Asahi seeking indemnification. In federal court, that will be done under Rule 14. We'll talk about that later in the course. For right now, you would need to be looking for a fact pattern where the defendant who's objecting to PJ was joined pursuant to one of these two rules, Rule 14, third party practice, or Rule 19, required parties. So for you to know more about that, we're really going to have to learn joinder, right? And joinder is something we're going to have in, say, I don't know, three weeks or so. It'll be after we, maybe two weeks, after we finish pleadings, we'll move, I believe, into joinder. And then you'll learn about Rule 14 and 19 and more. Well, if the defendant was joined under Rules 14 or 19, then you want, next want to know whether the defendant was served within 100 miles of 
the uh, uh, court for which the summons was issued. So you may recall that in class we talked about this fact pattern. Imagine there was a lawsuit in federal court in Tallahassee, the Northern District of Florida, and then you have P versus D, so it's victim, victim versus driver, and then say the driver then brings in as a third party defendant the tire shop. Now the accident was here in Tallahassee, so that's where the lawsuit was filed. There's no doubt that there's PJ over the driver, PJ's okay, but what about the tire shop? Let's assume the tire shop is here in Georgia within that 100 miles and assume the tire shop is served with the summons in Georgia within that 100 mile border. Well, then there would be bulge jurisdiction because first, this tire shop was joined under Rule 14 third party practice. They were served within 100 miles and they were served within a district court within a district of the United States. Let me just look here, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Yeah, I got it right. See, the three elements are joinder under 14 or 19, service within 100 miles of where the summons was issued, and service within a federal judicial district. Well, let's think about this. First, this defendant here was served within 100 miles. Second, they were joined under Rule 14, and they were served within a district in the United States, right? Georgia, the state of Georgia, has multiple federal districts, one of which includes the south of Georgia, right? So bulge rule would be okay. In contrast, if this scenario arose in state court, you wouldn't be able to use the bulge rule because that applies only in federal court because the Fifth Amendment allows broader PJ in federal court. But here's a counter hypo. Suppose the tire shop was sued, was served here, out at sea, within a hundred miles of the courthouse in Tallahassee from which the summons was issued. What do you think? No. Not within a district, right? A hundred miles out. Now I'm no maritime lawyer, but I'm pretty comf comfortable and confident that 100 miles out from the border of Florida is going to be international waters. So even if this defendant was served within 100 miles of the courthouse, they weren't served within a district of the United States. If you don't like that fact pattern, imagine that the courthouse is in the south of Texas and the defendant is served in Mexico, right? So you'd have a Rule 14 defendant was served within 100 miles, but not in a district of the United States. If you don't like that, the courthouse is in Seattle. You know, your Grace, your Grace Sloan Memorial Hospital in Seattle, okay? And the summons is issued from the federal court in, in uh, Seattle, Washington. And then the defendant is joined under Rule 14 and served in Vancouver, Canada, right? You get the idea. It makes sense, right? Because the Fifth Amendment still limits the power of federal courts the scope of PJ in federal courts, and we look to the borders of the United States. Judicial districts of the United States are part of the United States. Uh, Canada, Mexico, and international waters are not, right? That would be overreach and therefore impermissible. Okay, so that's bulge jurisdiction, all right? Um, this one is something we'll, we'll talk about more later, 4K1C. Sometimes the U.S. Congress has a statute that provides under certain circumstances will be nationwide service of process, which means nationwide PJ. It will be PJ over the defendant as long as they're served within any judicial district. One example of that is what we call a statutory interpleader. That's getting ahead of ourselves right now. Statutory interpleader involves joinder. And when we get to joinder, we'll come back to this issue and we'll see an illustration of 4K1C jurisdiction. Okay? But simply put, when Congress provides in the statute a specialized PJ statute by Congress, then that can be used under 4K1C. Uh, finally, we have 4K2. All right, 4K2, the claim has to arise under federal law. 4K1A jurisdiction cannot exist in any state court, and the assertion of PJ does not violate the Fifth Amendment. Okay, now what do these mean? First, the claim has to rise under federal law, right? So now we're thinking about subject matter jurisdiction, right? What's the basis for the SMJ over the claim? 
if it's a pure state claim, if there's no federal question jurisdiction at all, then you can't use 4K2. You can't. Second, you can't have any 4K1A jurisdiction at all. Well, what does that mean? Well, remember, 4K1A, well, let me get rid of that. Here we go. 4K1A is our basic PJ in federal court, the do in Rome as the Romans do, right? Long arm plus due process, 14th Amendment. 4K1A is our basic kind of vanilla flavor of PJ. Now, when we look at 4K2, one of the conditions for 4K2 is there can't be PJ in any state's court. How many states are there? 50. That means there can't be PJ in any of the 50 states in, in a state court of general jurisdiction. It means a basic state trial court, which means the only way you can have 4K2 jurisdiction is when you don't have 4K1A jurisdiction. If 4K1A is satisfied in any state, then 4K2 is unavailable. Okay? Now, that's why I like to call 4K2, not just the federal long-arm statute, kind of a fallback federal long-arm statute. It can only apply if there's no PJ hypothetically. We're doing this as a hypothetical, right? Hypothetically, would there be PJ in any state court of general jurisdiction? And if the answer is yes, then you can't use 4K2. All right? Generally speaking, 4K2 fallback federal long arm jurisdiction is only going to be available against foreigners, right? So we talked very briefly in class about the, uh, the Osama bin Laden case where bin Laden was sued in uh, the federal district court in the District of D.C. and the court used 4K2 uh, jurisdiction. So claim ar must arise under federal law. So copyright law, federal law, sure. Uh, negligence, no. State law, right? No 4K1A jurisdiction. And finally, PJ does not violate the Fifth Amendment. What does that mean? Well, remember, 14th Amendment limits by borders, right? So that's the border of the state. Fifth Amendment limits by borders as well. And now those are the borders of the entire United States. So uh, courts have oftentimes construed the last part of 4K2 jurisdiction to require, or rather to ask, are there minimum contacts between the defendant, typically a foreign defendant, in the entire United States. Are there minimum contacts with the whole United States? In the Bin Laden case, the court said, yeah, yeah, based on the malicious conspiracy to sow terror in the United States, that was enough to have minimum contacts with the United States. So that's kind of the idea here. All right, so that's in federal court. Now, by the way, this was all for purposes of review that I just said, right? Does anything that I just said have any relevance whatsoever to dealing with the Amazon fact pattern? No. no. Good. Because, you know, the three letters that I hate writing the most on any of your essays. N, I, S, negative issue spotting. Negative issue spotting is when you either go completely off the rails and talk about an issue that's just like way, way out there. So the question here is about, it, about PJ over Fed Express, right? You start talking about SMJ. Wow, that's like way off the rails. You can't get points for that, right? Talk about the call of the question. Negative issue spotting would also be talking about whether this PJ over um, Amazon, right? That wasn't the question, was it? The question was PJ over Fed Express. Negative issue spotting could also be more subtle. For instance, we're in state court and you start talking about Rule 4K. It doesn't apply. Not even arguable, right? Tag jurisdiction. Is there anything in that fact pattern that suggests there could be tag jurisdiction? No. First, there's no personal service. Second, the defendant's a corporation. You can't have tag over a corporation. So even though the question is PJ over Fed Express, you wouldn't talk about tag jurisdiction. That, again, would be negative issue spotting and a waste of your time, right? I give points for you guys talking about the issues that are reasonably raised, reasonably raised. Put that phrase into your head. Issues that are reasonably raised by the facts of the call of the question, right? Now, are you certain that there is general jurisdiction? No. Are you certain that there is not? No. no. no it's debatable, right? That's reasonably raised. You got to talk about that. Same thing is going to be true of specific jurisdiction. You got to talk about both, right? Now, property. 
Is there anything in this fact pattern to suggest jurisdiction over property, in rem or quasi in rem? No. no. Negative issue spotting. Don't go there. All right? You may think I need to talk about waiver and consent, right? Because the defendant objected to PJ, and therefore they didn't waive it. And you would, of course, be correct. How much time should you spend on that? Very brief. That's an ETBTTT little issue there, right? I'd say go in and out real quick, because the big, meaty issues here are going to be general and specific jurisdiction, right? All right, so use your time wisely. Time, Mick Jagger was wrong when he said, time is on my side. Time is not on your side, right? <laughs> it's not your friend, it's not your frenemy. It's your foe. Treat it as such. Use it wisely. Don't squander it. Right? Because the time you, you spend talking about something irrelevant is time you can't spend getting points for something that is. Right? Good. Let's go over here. In rem quasi rem, let's put that aside. Let's talk about in persona. All right? We're in state court. See how the top is in rem, and then down there it's in persona. Well, the first thing you got to talk about is the long arm statute, right? Now, first, what kind of long arm are we dealing with here? Is it enumerated or unenumerated? Unenumerated. Now, an enumerated long arm statute would be like the Florida, Illinois, and New York model. Uh, here's the Florida one, right? See that laundry list of bases for PJ? That's an enumerated long arm statute. And if there's an enumerated long arm statute, now you know you've got to start figuring out which part or parts of the statute are reasonably raised by the facts and make your argument and counter-argument as to whether they're satisfied, right? That means you're going to have to spend a lot more time talking about the long arm. Now, in this fact pattern, I said that the long arm went to the full scope of the due process clause. And in fact, here's California, CCP 410.10, court, court of the state can exercise PJ, a jurisdiction on any basis not inconsistent, constitution of this state, that's California, or of the United States, all right? That should tell you your analysis is going to be very, don't you dare do that. <laughs> now, you're all witnesses, it's on videotape. Close. It's always, up, always updated. All right. You do have to give a long arm analysis, right? It must be very brief. You can put it at the beginning, you can put it at the end. I don't care, just do it, right? Long arm says there's PJ as long as it's okay and consistent with the Constitution, right? Here, that means the 14th Amendment. But remember, the 14th Amendment is something that can prevent PJ, but it does not grant PJ. The 14th Amendment is not itself an authorization to state courts to have PJ. It just tells us when state courts can't have PJ. It, it, it acts kind of a divestment of PJ, all right? The long arm statute is the grant of PJ. That, a long arm statute is the state legislature saying to the courts of that state, we authorize you courts of our state to have PJ under such circumstances. If it's enumerated, then under these circumstances, right? If it's unenumerated, then to the full extent of due process. So, when you're analyzing the long arm statute, you're essentially saying something like, well, the long arm goes to the full extent of due process, so as long as the 14th Amendment doesn't prevent PJ, the long arm statute would therefore grant PJ. Courts of the state may exercise jurisdiction, right? Now, when are you going to know whether or not the long arm statute is satisfied? Before you analyze the 14th Amendment or after you analyze it? What's that? After. After, right? Satisfying the 14th Amendment, put more accurately, making sure the 14th Amendment doesn't prohibit jurisdiction, tells you whether or not the long arm statute is going to grant it. So the answer to your long arm statute analysis is going to hinge on your due process analysis. Something I look at, look for in essays from my students is how elegantly, how, how well they've given the long arm statute and analyzed it, especially with it unenumerated, because it's not a difficult analysis, but it's a little harder to write than you might think. Because analysis of one thing, the long arm, 
hinges upon your analysis and conclusion on another. So the conclusion to due process then helps you to complete your long arm analysis, right? So you might do long arm and then do process and then finish the long arm. You might do process, do due process and then do the long arm. But you definitely have to do both, right? Because it's like two stoplights. Every stoplight that's red, you've got to stop at and wait before you go, right? The same thing here. To have PJ, both the long arm statute's got to authorize it and the 14th Amendment can't be violated. So there's PJ if and only if due process and the long arm statute are both okay with it. My bet diagrams, right? You've got to satisfy both. All right, so that's the long arm statute. Let's keep moving on. 14th Amendment due process. Well, under 14th Amendment due process, we have traditional bases, right? And you have modern bases, which is minimum context. Let's start off with the traditional bases. The domicile. Domicile is something that has informed almost everything we've learned so far, right? It informs diversity jurisdiction. It informs PJ. It informs um, venue that we covered last week, right? Well, domicile is often thought of as being a basis for traditional jurisdiction, traditional PJ. It's a little bit more complicated than that because in dicta, uh, the Daimler and Goodyear cases said regarding individuals, they're subject to general in personam jurisdiction when they're domiciled, right? But regardless, when is domicile going to apply? With the corporation? No. Why, why is it? Can corporations be domiciled? They can't, or they can't. What's domicile? Is domicile something a corporation does? Residents of the state with intent to stay indefinitely. Who does that? A corporation or a person? Yeah, domicile is just peeps, right? People. Corporations aren't domicile. Corporations have PPOBs and places of incorporation, right? So is domicile reasonably raised by this fact pattern? Not at all, right? But if it was individual and the facts are telling you things about where they live and it's at least reasonably arguable that the person is domiciled in the forum state, regardless of your conclusion, reasonably raised doesn't mean PJ exists. It means it's arguable, reasonably arguable, right? Reasonably arguable means you could have made that argument in front of the late Justice Scalia without him yelling at you or trying to make you look foolish, right? Something you can say to the judge with a straight face, even if the judge rejects it, right? Something that passes the straight face test. <coughs> All right, so domicile. Not an issue here. Consent and waiver, right? Consent and waiver. Not an issue here as we already discussed, right? Consent is when you do something that leads to PJ, like a form selection clause. <coughs> or stipulation. Waivers when you fail to do something that leads to a finding of PJ. All right, that's not largely an issue here, but it will probably be worth a very, very brief mention. Mention it, fine, move along, right? Oh, there's a special appearance, and therefore they didn't waive PJ. All right, we'll talk more about waiver of PJ and other defenses when we get to Rule 12, and I'll be able to flesh that out then. All right, um, I'm going to move on then. Transient presence, the tag rule. All right, now we studied this one by way of a handout. So go back to the handout here. Tag jurisdiction, as we've learned it, means personal service on an individual defendant, not a corporate defendant, but an individual defendant, when they serve personally with process while voluntarily in the form state. If the person is tricked in the gun there, right, then that may mean no tag jurisdiction, right? Um, if they're confused about how they got there, right, they got there accidentally, maybe you can argue they, they weren't there intentionally, all right? But assuming that they were there voluntarily and intentionally and they were personally served with process, in most cases they're going to be PJ. I didn't assign you the burden case, so I'm not going to belabor burden. There's a split amongst the Supreme Court as to whether or not TAG remains a valid traditional basis or whether it is instead needs to be analyzed under minimal contacts test, okay? I'm not going to ask you to talk about that in an essay in class because I didn't assign the case, but I want you to know there's that split in the court. And if you're interested about it, go back to the handout, come to me, I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. All right, 
with the exception of waiver, and here there's no waiver, none of the traditional bases are reasonably raised by this fact pattern, right? So that leaves the modern basis of minimum contacts. And we have here general jurisdiction, all-purpose jurisdiction, and specific jurisdiction where the contacts give rise to the claim. All right, let's start off with general jurisdiction. General jurisdiction is all-purpose jurisdiction. That might apply here, arguably so, right? Where was the plaintiff injured? Where was he injured? In France, in Paris. Was he injured in the forum state? No. He was not. Does the defendant, that express, have contacts with the forum state? Yes. Yeah. Are the defendant's contacts with California extensive? Yes. So now we have extensive contacts, right? More than a single or isolated contact. And the injury was suffered outside the state, so you should immediately start thinking, oh man, what about general in personam jurisdiction? All right, now we think about the standard here. Systematic and continuous contacts that render the defendant essentially at home in the form of the state. Keep in mind that Daimler and Goodyear make it very clear that systematic and continuous are not enough. It's got to be something more. Right? It's almost like Emerald used to say on his cooking show, turn it up a notch, right? Systematic and continuous is not enough. The systematic suggests a plan, coordinated activity in the state. Does Fed Express have coordinated activity in the state of California? Does it? Yeah. Sure does. Over a billion dollar a year. 5% of its business. And that's even before that five year contract as being the exclusive shipper of goods for Amazon. So we have systematic. Is the, are the contacts also continuous? Yes. yes. Uh, Fed Express has been operating continuously for years, and we know that it's going to be, that its contacts with California are going to be even expanded, at least over the next five years, right? Continuous is systematic, absolutely. Now, Daimler tells us for a corporation that the place of bank and the PPOB are places where a corporation will always be subject to general jurisdiction. But neither of those apply here, do they? But we have fallback general jurisdiction for the exceptional case, which is noted in footnote 19 of Daimler. So what do you have to start thinking about? Does this qualify as exceptional general jurisdiction? And guess what? I don't know the answer. I don't know. Go back and read footnote 19. Does footnote 19 give us a lot of information? does not. The court cites to an earlier case, right, Perkins, where you had a Philippine mining corporation that was out of business during the Japanese occupation of Japan. So they set up shop in Ohio, kind of just like a corporate storefront for a couple years until the Americans took back the islands, right? But they had limited but continuous corporate activities in that state. That was enough. So what does that mean? I don't know. What arguments can you make? That I do know. And that's what you need to think about. What argument can you make that Fed Express is at home away from home in California? And what counter arguments can you make? So let me ask real quickly. What argument might you make that Fed Express is at home, at home away from home in California? Because home is Delaware. In, in Georgia, right? Is California like another new home, a home away from home? Yes. Okay, how? The, all the deliveries? The all, contract. all the deliveries? Yeah, what's it got to do in order to handle all those deliveries? What's it going to need to send to the warehouses every day? All, the trucks. all those trucks, right? How many trucks do you think it's going to need? A few? Yeah, 100 at least, right? Maybe more, right? Plus, oh, where's it going to keep all those trucks? In, in my backyard? What's going to have to have in California? Warehouses. Its own warehouses and garages and facilities, right? What would we'll need to have almost like a, a, a another base of operations almost? If not its principal place, maybe a really big place, right? And how about these trucks? What do these trucks say? FedEx, FedEx, Amazon, right? Kind of like, you know, 
What did FedEx Express and Amazon, in a sense, almost do? Like brothers? Like brothers? Yeah, even more than that. Not the same corporation, no. They're, they're almost like in like a venture together, right? If it was a relationship between uh, uh, two adults, what, 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 what might we call that in a sense? <laughs> almost like a marriage of a sorts, right? Not a legal partnership. I don't want to confuse you for your business association court. More like some sort of like venture, right? But you see, you see the smiles in the, in the room now. The thoughts bubbling. What arguments could you make that FedEx Express is home away from home? That it's like this almost marriage. So you've got to use your imagination based on the facts, what's likely to occur, are they going to be at home, and, and why might that satisfy footnote 19? Now, you have to think about what kind of arguments can you make, right? So you, you might want to argue. Peter Parker will argue that even though California is not the PPOB or Inc., nonetheless, it's another place, pursuit to footnote 19, where they're essentially at home because blah, 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 that's your job. Fed Express will counter argue that blah, 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 blah. The better conclusion, in my opinion, is that blah, blah, blah. You with me? That's how you do it. So, is there general jurisdiction? No idea. You know what we'll find out when the Supreme Court has another case. Maybe that'll give guidance, most likely it will not. PJ, the Supreme Court's been screwing that up now for over 100 years, right? So why won't they continue? Um, but yet, yeah, it's an issue we would have to discuss. All right, let's go into specific jurisdiction. General jurisdiction is all purpose. As long as you're continuous, systematic, at home in that state, then you can be sued there for anything, right? I'm Donald Solomon, Florida. Please don't sue me, but if you do, I can be sued here for anything. Same for all of you that are domiciled here in the state of Florida. All right. Subject to the Florida Long Arm Statute, of course. Specific jurisdiction requires a sufficient job. Can you believe that? <laughs> oh, oh, man. New is picture day. What? The tablet new is picture day. The tablet new is picture day. Okay, who wants to join me in, in a long and nasty letter to Bill Gates? <laughs> so, yeah. Get some damages. And even I denied it. I denied it. Permission to restart, didn't I? You did. I did. All right. Uh, we're just going to continue because we only have the room for another 20 minutes and then something's coming in at 6, I think. So I'm just going to continue, but we can do this without that. Uh, we'll go analog, we'll go old school. Old school. All right, and I'm going to show you how serious I am about it by taking uh -oh. off my jacket. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is getting warm in here. Yeah. 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 That's Davidson. All right. Specific jurisdiction requires a connection between the defendant, the forum, and the plaintiff's claim, right? So you need to have contacts giving rise to the claim, right? So here you're going to want to go to the handout that I gave you, right, on specific versus general jurisdiction. For specific jurisdiction, all you talk about, excuse me, for general jurisdiction, all we care about is the extent of a purposeful availment, right? Systematic and continuous contacts that render the defendant essentially at home. With corporations, it's Inc, PPOB, and footnote 19. For individuals, it's domicile and footnote 19. Now, the actual analysis might be difficult. Analysis and counter-analysis, right? But the basic concepts are fairly straightforward, and the structures are fairly straightforward. Specific jurisdiction is a little bit more complex because it's got three steps. Step one, you have purposeful availment, right? The defendant has purposefully availed itself of the privileges and benefits of the uh, laws of the forum state. You drive to Massachusetts, you get into a car rack, well, the police will assist you. The medics and the hospitals will treat you. They don't tell you you're from Florida, go away, we won't help you. No, they help you. So by driving and Massachusetts, by having that contact, you do get benefits. Whether or not you 
take advantage of those benefits, right? So in, in that sense, it's a quid pro quo, right? By getting those advantages, you are then, a, you are then um, subjecting yourself to the courts of that state for any lawsuits that arise out of your context, right? So that's why, whereas general jurisdiction is all purpose, specific jurisdiction is case specific. I should say even cont Supreme Court says case specific. Um, I'll say kind of context. <gasps> Look at this. Oh, we don't want to get too excited. It, it's starting to come back, you see. But it might go through like 20 minutes of cycling. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll keep you updated. I'm sure we'll be done by the time we leave. Um, Contact specific, that's right. All right. So the first step is purposeful availment. The second step is giving rise. And the third step are the reasonableness factors. All right? Now let's talk about the first step, purposeful availment. We already talked about what purposeful availment is. We've seen purposeful, purposeful availment in a whole bunch of contexts, right? In a whole bunch of contexts. It says 96% complete. And it's locking me in. Oh, okay, can't see my password. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yay! All right, Mr. Gates will let you a little bit off the hook today, but we really need to uh, contact Microsoft about that. That's kind of not a good feature. I'll get the complaint ready. I know, I know. Let's get some data. Okay, first of all, let's pull our toggle back up. Open. Yay! We even stayed on time. All right. So the first step is those minimum contacts showing the defendant purposely built itself of the privilege and benefits of the form state. Don't tell me that minimal contacts and purposeful development and stream of commerce are, are, are three different things. They are not. Minimum contacts is usually used as the name of the overall test from international shoe and its progeny. Um, minimal contacts also refers to that first step, right? The purposeful development. In that first step, we're asking about the nature of the contacts between the defendant and the forum state. They might be single or isolated. They might be systematic and continuous, like in international shoe. All we're asking about is the nature of the contacts. Now, does FedExpress have contacts with California? Yes. yes. Does it have a single contact or a few or a whole bunch? A whole bunch. A whole bunch. Without a doubt, systematic and continuous. Okay. In, in fact, FedExpress's contacts. Which which contacts are higher? International shoes contacts with the state of Washington. Fed Express's contacts with the state of California. Express. It ain't even close, right? Fed Express is, is, is humongous in terms of its contacts. All right. Well, we've read a whole bunch of cases that deal with purposeful availability in different contexts. Shoe was about taxes, right? You have your salespeople in the state selling shoes. Do those contacts give rise to unemployment tax obligations? Uh, we have we have Asahi, which I'll get to in a second. We have Burger King, which is the purposeful development was, what about these guys from Michigan, particularly Rudzowitz, who enters into a contract with a Florida corporation to do the negotiations and the terms of the contract, along with the duration and value of the contract, uh, mean that there's purposeful development with the state of Florida. The court said yes, right? Now, Asahi, uh, negligence, Hess, this reimagine my international shoe is, is another example of purposeful development, right? You drive to Massachusetts to cause an accident, you can be sued there. There was just one contact driving to the state, right? That's enough for purposeful development under those facts. Stream of commerce. Stream of commerce is when a product, it's either a finished product or a component of a product, it doesn't have to be physical. Maybe it could be computer, right? Maybe even computer code. It's some good that goes from the place of manufacturer, and then it goes from the manufacturer to one or more intermediaries. Intermediaries mean people in the middle, right? Say like 
um, Best Buy or say some um, warehouse or reseller, right? Warehouser that buys from a whole bunch of companies and then sells it from all the computers. Here are all the computer companies including Microsoft and then they sell to Bob's Computers which is a warehouser that buys from all computer companies like Microsoft and Apple and whatever. And then they sell them to retailers around the country like say Best Buy and whatever. All right, well those goods went through the stream of commerce from Microsoft to Bob's Warehouse to the Best Buy where you bought them. All right, the goods were not sold to you by Apple or Microsoft. They were sold to you by, say, Best Buy here in Florida, right? But they went from the place of manufacture, wherever that might be, whether it's Washington or California or China or wherever, it went through that stream of commerce, okay, to the place of eventual sale. And what these cases are dealing with, what Asahi is dealing with is asking, in what stream of commerce scenarios will we say there's purposeful development and, which, and in which con uh, scenarios are the contacts not going to be enough, right? And we had a split in the court. That's what's important about Asahi. We're trying to figure out what counts under that first of the three steps, right? Three steps for specific jurisdiction. Purposeful availment, giving rise, and reasonableness. We're still talking about that first step. Purposeful availment. Stream of commerce analysis is a way of analyzing purposeful availment for that first step when you have goods going from a manufacturer to, through one or more intermediaries and then to the final place where they are bought by the consumer and injured the consumer in that state. So in Asahi, you have that valve that went from place of manufacture in Japan, then it went to Shangxi in Taiwan, or was incorporated into a tube. Then it may have gone through additional steps because it eventually got to a tire that was in the Yamaha motorcycle that Zerker drove and he and, and his, his, his young woman were injured in, right? The young woman, as I recall, was killed. Tragic accident. Well, he bought that motorcycle or the tire or both in California, okay? He didn't buy that tire or the tube in it directly from Asahi. That tube went from Japan. Taiwan to one or more other places and other intermediaries until it was in that tire that was involved in that tragic accident. Okay? That's the stream of commerce fact pattern. That doesn't mean there's purposeful availment yet. Now you gotta ask, is that enough to be purposeful availment, right? There's, co there's contacts, but do these contacts count for purposeful availment? We have three views, right? Analyze them in this order, please. First, Brennan. A four justice plurality said the contacts through the stream of commerce are going to count for purposeful availment if the defendant is aware that the goods are going to be marketed in that state where they cause injury, right? And there's regular and anticipated flow of the goods from the place of manufacture to the place of sale. So for Brennan, the facts of Asahi were enough for purposeful availment because the facts suggested that Asahi knew that its vows would be sold in California. That was enough. O'Connor requires more. Thus, her, her version of purposeful availment is called Stream of Commerce Plus. She wants more. Now, what that means, she wants more than Brennan. Now, this is why you do Brennan before you do O'Connor. O'Connor's analysis requires Brennan's analysis to be satisfied, and then more needs to be satisfied. So, if Brennan is a no, then O'Connor is going to be a no, too. But if Brennan is a yes, we're not done with O'Connor, okay? O'Connor requires what she calls purposeful direction. Horribly confusing. She's still just kind of saying purposeful availment. She has to have her own phrase, all right? Well, she's, she's making a point, right? She's making a point, which is that it, it's not just a stream of commerce. It's got to be something more. So she likes the idea of directing your activities, the defense activity towards the state. So she's semantically making a really good point. But what's frustrating for the student about purposeful direction, you're like, well, what's the difference between mineral contacts and stream of commerce? And what's purposeful availment? And now, yeah, yeah, now we got, got to deal with purposeful direction. So what I'm telling you is purposeful direction is just her way of saying purposeful availment in the stream of commerce context. So don't get caught too much up in her words. It's just another way of saying purposeful availment. She wants plus. She wants more than uh, Brennan. So what are those plus factors? Well, she gives a bunch of them in, in the case, right? Designing the product for the forum state. 
advertising in the forum state, establishing channels for regular advice to customers in the forum state, or marketing the product through a distributor uh, who agrees to be the sales agent in the forum state. But the mere awareness that the goods will be sold in the state, that's just not enough. It's telling us that Brennan, it, Brennan being a yes is a necessary condition for O'Connor saying yes. Necessary, but not sufficient. To satisfy O'Connor's test, you need to satisfy, satisfy Brennan's test, and then give more. And third, you have the Stevens approach. Okay, you have the Stevens approach, which says look to the volume, value, and hazardous nature um, of uh, the goods. Right? Volume, value, and hazardous nature of the goods. So you would analyze all three. Now, if you had a, a fact pattern that dealt with stream of commerce, under the purposeful availment prong, you need to have three separate sub-analyses, right? So think about it. Specific jurisdictions itself got three steps, right? One, two, three. Purposeful availment, giving rise, and reasonable risk factors. But for stream of commerce, under that first step, purposeful availment, you'd have three sub-steps, wouldn't you? You'd have to have three sub-analyses. Fair enough. And each of those analyses may have even a, a counter-analysis if there was a plausible counter-analysis worth making. You do that as well. You learn by doing. Now, in this fact pattern, is this a stream of commerce fact pattern? No. no. It is not. There were no shipments of goods in the state of California that, that gave rise to the claim. All right? There were shipments of goods in the California, but those have nothing to do with the claim. What you have is systematic and continuous activities in California. So you have lots of purposeful development, so you just do a basic analysis of the nature and extent of context, which here are systematic and continuous. So in this fact pattern, you wouldn't even talk about stream of commerce. Now you go to the second step. Do the context give rise to the claim? All right. Now that's going to be the hard one in this fact pattern. Now some courts use the evidence test, but some courts use a different test, a different test, the but-for test. Some courts may not have decided. Well, unless I tell you the instructions what test to use, you would analyze both in the alternative. So let's analyze both. The but-for test. Ask about the causal chain of events, right, from the contacts to the injury. But for the defendant's contacts in the state of California, there would not have been an injury in France. Can you make that argument? I will leave it to you. <laughs> I think the argument can be made. Look at the causal events. What ran into Peter Parker in California? And what did he say on that truck? He said what? He said FedEx Amazon, or Amazon FedEx, right? It was one of those dual logo trucks, right? Why is that dual logo truck in France? Because of the parts. Joe, what's that? Delivering. And why is Am why is Fed Express having a truck in France that says Amazon Fed Express? It came out of the partnership that happened yeah. in California. Yeah, that, that contract. Right. So the truck in France with two logos on it, two names on it, exists because the contract that was executed in the state of? California. California. And the goods on that truck were picked up from the state of? California. So might you argue that but for the contract and the shipments from California? You wouldn't have had that truck in that place at that time. Maybe you have a kind of argument too, but you definitely have an argument worth considering. Now the evidence test looks at the plaintiff's claim here, which is negligence, right? And asks, are the California contacts relevant evidence to relevant evidence for the, the claim of negligence? Okay? That's going to be a harder argument to make. You have to think about what evidence will Peter be using to prove that. Fed Express was negligent in France. Would any of that evidence involve contacts with California? That's the argument you should make. Okay. Write up the essay. Bring it to me. Let me give you feedback. So maybe you conclude that the contacts give rise. Maybe you conclude they don't. Maybe you conclude it's debatable and it's hard to say. But then you move on to the next step, which is the reasonableness factors. First thing you have to know is if purposeful development exists, then the burden shifts to the defendant to show a compelling case of unreasonableness, right? Now, is there purposeful development with California? Absolutely, in significant context. So now, FedEx Press, assuming that the contacts gave rise to the claim, 
then Fed Express has to show compelling unreasonableness. Now, the most important factor is the burden on the defendant. All right. Is Fed Express going to be burdened significantly by having to defend in California? No. Good argument. I think the better argument is probably no, but when you get to the reasonableness factors, there's oftentimes going to be lots of space for argument and counter argument. On the one hand, they've got significant operations there. They probably have employees, lawyers. It's going to be no hassle for them to have to go there, right? On the other hand, the case may involve French law, right? So that might be burdensome for them. Um, so think about what arguments you can make. Second factor is the interest of the plaintiff. Why is Peter wanting to litigate in California when he's from New York? Now, I'm going to leave that for you to think about, and I'm curious what you're going to say in your essays. I'm not going to say because we're running short on time. The third factor, interest in the forum state. Does California have an interest in hearing this case? And what counter-argument can you make? Where is the accident? France. France. What interest might California have? I think there's argument and counter-argument to be made. You guys are going to make it and bring me your practice essays. Okay. Efficiency. Is it efficient to litigate in California or is it inefficient? Where are witnesses from? Where's evidence? Right? Judicial efficiency. All the stuff we were talking about with pleading yesterday, right? But the principle of efficiency is contained in FRCP 1. And finally, that last factor, the substantive social interests, uh, the, the shared interests of the, 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 the states in substantive social policy. Ask yourself, do, do California and other states, and here even France, care about giving tort remedies to people? What do you think? I don't put a lot of emphasis on that factor. It seems to me like a make way factor. But make whatever argument you can. Whereas factor four looks to efficiency, things like cost, and witnesses and evidence where they're located. Factor five looks at the social policy that underlies the cause of action itself, which here would be negligence. All right. Now, we're going to run short on time, so I'm not going to talk about property. We're going to res reserve that for another day or during another review session or later in the semester. All right. But what we've done today is we've gone over in some great detail the big picture of in personam jurisdiction in both. Don't put stuff away yet because it's going to be pulled up on the video. We're almost done. Federal court and state court, right? Federal court, you have 4K1A, which means you jump over to the state court analysis and do long arm plus due process. Federal court, you also have those additional bases that are allowed by the Fifth Amendment and Rule 4K1B, C, and 4K2. Then in state court, you have to do your long arm. And then you go the 14th Amendment, right? Which means first look at your traditional bases, and second, look at modern bases. And depending on the facts, that might be general and specific or just one or the other, right? Only raise bases that are reasonably raised by the facts. Now, here's the last thing I'm going to say to you. Your ultimate conclusion in this essay is going to be there either was PJ or there was not. Or there's most likely PJ or most likely not, right? Or there's PJ contingent on whatever. But you're going to make a conclusion, right? Now, PJ doesn't require all the bases to be satisfied. As long as the is satisfied, then there's going to be PJ so long as any of the due process bases are satisfied. So if the only basis you have is tag jurisdiction, there's PJ. If the only basis you have is domicile, there's PJ. If you say, oh, there's no general jurisdiction, but there's this specific jurisdiction, there's PJ. If you say, oh, there's no giving rise to no specific jurisdiction, but you find there would be general jurisdiction, then there's PJ, right? So, like, you could have, um, I'm getting tired, so I can't think of a good metaphor now, but, you know, it's like ten fingers, right? Um, it's things like domicile and tag and waiver and consent and all those other things, general and specific. How many fingers have to be up for due process to be satisfied? One. All right. Thank you guys for your time. I'll see you tomorrow in class. Have a good day.